Okay, so this is architecture one. Um, we're going to start with that one. I'll go through each of the courses this morning. If you can log into Revit, you're ahead of me today um, by far. And um, this is very, I should just stay home. It would have been easier. My stuff works. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's take into the announcements for today. Um, we're going to go with each, each of the three classes uh, to get you set up. And um, here is what's due for this uh, coming week. It's actually for the next two weeks. Okay. So in Architecture 1, if you look at the week four announcement, um, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to come back today or not, but I got approved last night at 9 o'clock. So woohoo. That was really good. Um, when we look at the assignments, you have, uh, they're not on the board anymore. The stuff from week one and two is still there if you haven't finished it. Several of you have been concerned about the state skills test practice test, why that's on your grade. It's on the grade until everybody does it, and I can't change it until everybody's done it. And there's a few of you who have not done that yet. Once everybody's gotten finished with it, it'll switch to a practice test and will come off your grades. Okay? I would hope that you'd be done by week four to do what was done in week one. Um, and I'm a little concerned that I've got several online students who haven't even logged into Canvas yet. So they're probably going to get the butt kicked out today uh, because I, we, we, there's no way to catch up if they're getting too far behind. So if you're one of those who are listening to this and you have yet to log into your course, um, you've got literally 12 hours to make a recommendation of what to fix there. Okay, so we then have a wall quiz. Um, there's components quizzes. We're going to go over these, I think, today and together, um, mainly because I'm punting big time. Um, but that's okay. Teachers get that. There's also a space planning quiz. Space planning is really how you're putting things in the space. So the plan today was because you guys are like, you're two days ahead of the bead hey students. Blue. Blue, yeah, which is fine. Um, but we got to start putting in things like water closets and tubs and sinks and cabinets and kitchens and refrigerators. Okay. That's space planning. That's, there's a lot to it. So if we just spend some time just chatting about that, um, that's a good thing. And I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, then um, week seven. Now, once we get to unit seven, notice these are due a week from Friday. They're not due this Friday. They're due, um, in some cases, next Friday. So plan accordingly here okay so this is all here make your plan most of these shouldn't take you more than 20 minutes to do okay they really shouldn't especially when you get down here to fractions you can use a calculator okay you really shouldn't need to but you can yeah um, the floor plan quiz is about things you've already done what is a wall <laughs> what's a partition wall that kind of thing okay let me jump into what's architecture two. So I get everybody in the same. Just gonna breathe. I need to breathe. It's hard to breathe. <laughs> Someday we'll not be wearing masks anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the whole world will die. Okay, architecture two students. You have fewer assignments, but there's more research and reading you need to do to answer them. Okay, so the first one is IRC, that's the International Residential Code. It is written in the United States, but applies to all of the Western Hemisphere now and to certain countries in the Eastern Hemisphere. So it is an American code that's been adopted by Canada and Mexico and Central America. And I think Brazil is on board now and Chile is on board. The good thing about that, that means the standard of living is increasing because the quality of their buildings are increasing. Um, we still have shanty towns. We've got a ways to go for that. If you've been to Mexico, you know what those are like. Um, but we're working on it. We're getting there. And then adding co compliant doors and windows, that's basically um, turning in your screenshot of your paper. And show you, I was going to show you how to do that. <sighs> so many things to do. Gotta love it. Okay, one more duplicated tab here. I'm going to bounce around on these to get everybody. Take care of. And yes. Could you like connect the screen to my computer if it's different? Um, I don't know if they've got that set up for me or not. 
Let me see if that stuff is even on my screen. No, it's not on my screen. I can't even do that. Joy of joys. Um, cool. We'll, we'll punch. We'll, it'll work out. This is actually going to work out okay. Okay, in architecture four, um, three, um, this is what you need to do. Um, you have your floor plans. Um, you have your walls and windows. There's some questions there about what those are like. Um, you need to add your floor and ceilings to your space. So if you've got multiple stories, you should be getting all your walls laid out. I'm not looking at new walls, but existing walls on this. So if you're architecture three, I'm looking for your existing walls, first and second floor, if you have a second floor. If you're doing, um, some of them have partial second floors, not full. And then we've got vertical circulation, which is stairs for the commercial people. Your commercial stairs are a little bit more involved. And we'll try and get through as much of this today as possible. Okay. Whew. All right, let's take and then jump back one to architecture two. And what I want to do is I want to show you guys what you're going to be dealing with, okay? Um, so it's module three, unit three. Okay, so let's talk about this right here. Um, when you guys go into these modules, um, there are videos that are not my lecture. There are videos on how to do those techniques. So for instance, this video right here for architecture two is about putting indoors windows, the same stuff we did last week in class. Okay. But it, there it's a little more, um, a little more zoomed in, if you will, a little bit easier to see for there. Let's take a look at um, what you're doing here. Um, So there are questions that you'll see again. That's kind of typical. I'm going to give you a preview real quick here to kind of help you. Oh, no. So I, I, what I want to do is not have you feel overwhelmed with the assignments. Architecture 1, you're the, you should feel overwhelmed, but it's because you're building foundation stuff. Then when you take Architecture 2, it'll be a little more review-based on there. So architecture two, what's the dimensions of the front entry door of a residence? What's, a, what's that common size? You can call it out. Three, 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 yes, exactly. Yeah. The three foot wide, six foot eight tall, that's the door you're selecting. Um, minimum size bathroom. This is a little tougher because it's in inches, not in feet and inches. So I'll give you the feet and inches and you can convert. Five foot by seven yeah. is the very smallest bathroom you can have, and that's for both one and two. Yes, 60 by 84. Um, that is really, really tight. You will not have three feet for your toilet. You'll have 30 inches at that point, okay? That means um, elbows to cabinet. Okay, it, it's, it's a tight fit. But that is the very smallest you can make a bathroom work and still get shower tub, water closet, and lavatory all in there. Okay? Um, so you have, I mean, how many questions they give you? They're, they're pretty much just going through and should be what you've heard me talk about for the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. If you've listened, you should be able to answer these. Depth of the closet. How much, the, how, how deep is the closet? Two feet. Two feet. How much space do you need in front of the, the porcelain god? So from your knees to the floor for everybody is about 24 inches. Uh -huh. And that's what you need in front of the water closet so you can kneel and release. Uh -huh. Okay. And that, that's very important. If you've ever been in an old remodeled home where you don't have that much space, it's just awkward. It really is kind of, even, even if you're not depositing from the mouth, there's just not a lot of room there. They're just awkward. I, I was did one remodel where the, the toilet was underneath a stair and the ceiling was here, literally. And so you had to hunch down to get and then wiggle well underneath it. And it just it wasn't it's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah, they're pretty common in re, re, 
bibbed houses. So you not you want that space. It's good. Okay, and then you're opening for your egress. Remember, you have 5.7 square feet. So which of these will meet that requirement? Okay, that's what you're working. So if you guys, if arc two, if you guys will move into that mode and start this one. Let me show you the other one though, real quick, that you have to work on. Because I think that's where most of your questions will be. Okay, so if we go to right here, by next Friday, we should be putting our kitchens together, okay? Um, is that all I gave you guys? Okay, yeah, that's all I've given you. So let's look at this adding the compliant doors windows. We did that last week. I know you're not finished. I know I can't see your screens, but I kind of know. Let me open this up. This applies to kind of everybody. Okay, so what this, this is where you're going to upload your image. Okay, and I'm going to try and get those in for each of your classes to upload these checkoffs, not the full plan. One, your Revit file is almost um, half a gig in size now. And we haven't done hardly anything yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is on hopefully, well, they're, they're ordered. They should be here on Wednesday. I've ordered a, a USB drive for everybody. So you can save your file and carry it back and forth rather than going through the Google Drive and, and all that. Orange, she did last yeah, unless you got one last time, then you already got it. But I, she didn't write down any names. So I don't care if you get two. I don't care. We'll just work it out. It's just money. What the heck, right? It's not your money. It is my money, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, it kind of is. That's okay because you guys haven't paid your course fees yet. You, you just were barely able to start doing those now, so no worries. Okay, so what you're looking at here is you need to make sure your name is on it, and I'm gonna have to fake this out big time. Okay, super big time fake out. So let's say um, let me find a picture. Let's say this is your assignment right here. And um, you've gone crazy. That's an office complex. Um, so not even, a, but that would be for architecture three. But, and this is what I want you to turn in, okay? Well, there's, I've, I kind of tried to explain the print screen option, which works for a lot of you, um, but you have to put it into a Word document, then upload it, okay? And that works fine. That's good. But there's an easier way to get where you want. If you will um, come down to the bottom where your Windows icon is, right, this little guy, we'll type SNP, okay, then bring up the snipping tool app that's built into Windows, and let's see if that thing comes open here. Oh. Oops, there it was there. It looks like this when it opens up, this little guy right here. Oh, I just closed my window. Oh, Windows. When they start making everything funny. So what you would do on here to submit your file is you would hit new. How many know how to use the snipping tool? Okay, that's good. That's really good. So you click on your snipping tool. Um, it's going to shade out the whole back once you hit new. Then you just left click and drag a window over it. And then in order for me to know whose it is when you upload it, I need your name on there. Kind of, kind of an important part. Um, unfortunately, there's not a way to type your name in, in Snippet. So you don't have to use the pen tool. Actually, there is. There's a way you can type your name. Should I show you that? Okay. You get this little uh, multicolored teardrop thing. That takes you to what used to be called paint, then it disappeared, and now they brought it back again. So if you click on that, it's gonna open you up into a new window that looks like this. Okay, now at this point, you can go ahead and click on the text tool, and you can put your text and type your name. 
And if you need to, you can highlight over that, especially that black background like this is. Um, you can change that font color so that you can see it. And you can adjust all that and move it. And if it kind of it just gets on it, you have to be inside the image. This light gray will not save. So you kind of have to overlap a little bit when you do that. But that, that's the way you can type your name on so you get it. And then save it as an image file. Okay. So that would be up under menu. Save as. Save it as an image. It'd be a, probably the PNG or JPEG. Both of those will be fine. And PNG some be the default. That that'll work just fine. And that's what you'll upload for your grade. Okay. Does that make sense? So a little simpler there. If you don't want to spend the time to go to Paint, then you can take a little pen tool and you can write your name with your mouse which totally sucks, but you can do it, okay? And that'll work as well. Then just save this out as again as an image file and that's what you'll upload, okay? So that'll work for how we submit until we get to drawings and that'll be coming here shortly. Okay, any questions on what you submit for grade? So is this good for both the grades? Yes. Okay. Yeah, now- the same for both? Mm -hmm. It'll be the same for architecture one, two, and three. You'll all do that the same way. Um, in architecture three, I'm asking a little bit more. I need to be able to see each floor separate and then show me a 3D view of the outside so I know your floors are stacked right. Okay. Um, so you have to look at those drawings, those 2D drawings, and we bring in them on each level. So um, hopefully you're a little bit more versed with Revit and you can kind of get that together. Okay. Any questions for architecture three? I think there's only one of you and they're online. So. Okay, let's go architecture um, one, which is the majority of you. Um, architecture two students, any questions on what I want you to work on for right now? Is go ahead and do your homework. If you can get into Revit, if it's working, finish your walls, doors, and we didn't, we just barely started windows, didn't we? If you want to hold off on windows, that I'm cool with that. But I want walls and doors for sure. Okay, um, get those in there. Go to one and let's, um, we're gonna go right into the quiz for unit four, the one that's first due, and it's about wall parts. Uh, we drew walls, we've modified walls, but we haven't identified all the parts of a wall. And that's the part we wanna work on here. So, um, and I can either, we'll do it, we can either do the quiz together or we can go through um, a 64 slide PowerPoint, bore you to death, and you feel like you died. And we've all felt that enough lately. Okay. So let's start right here with the wall section quiz. So if you're in architecture one in Canvas, you want to open this up. We're going to work through it right together and save you some time over the weekend or the week, whichever way you want to go with that. Okay. Lucas, you with me? Okay. All righty. Opening that up. Let's Go ahead, and I'm gonna have to do preview because I'll show the answers if I did the other way. <laughs> All right, you get a picture of a wall section. Um, so we have uh, a basement. We, we know it's a basement because there's a concrete floor here. That's our first big clue when we look at a wall section. Um, we have our flooring in here. The squiggle lines are insulation. So they're not just scribbles, they're, they're actually the symbol for insulation as we go through that. And what we want to do is go through and answer what each part is. Okay. So if I'm building, and let's start at the very top with this, and um, we're looking at the letter A. So the letter A is pointing to the symbol. And this symbol is a triangle. That triangle shows um, an eight, and then what should be a 12. The one is missing on that. Okay, now this symbol has been modified a little bit over the years. It's an older symbol. 
So um, that was us to show this. When the symbol has a line on the bottom of it, um, I'm going to turn my computer here so they can see. And I'm going to draw on the board. So if I've got a house and this is the roof and I'm looking at it from the side and not from the angle, then I would use the triangle that closes off because I'm not showing the real slope of that roof. Okay. So on the other side of this, making sure I'm on the camera, where this is a gable, then this would be an open triangle. Okay. Because I've, the roof finishes that out. Okay. That's the traditional way of doing it. Some firms are using it both for both ways now, but traditionally that's how it's shown. The top, the horizontal, is always 12. Always. It's always based on a foot. And it's rise over run, which is slope. And then the vertical is whatever we want it to be. Three or eight. Those in the same house can't be that way. Three is important. If you have a 3 and 12 slope, that is the shallowest roof you can have with shingles. So you can't go to a 2 and 12 and put shingles on it. No. Okay, so if you go less than 3, then you have to use a built-up roof system, which usually involves rock on your roof, um, rubber membranes, uh, tar, all of which no one wants to do it. Um, when we see fires in commercial buildings in the summer, it's usually because they're fixing the tar on the flat roofs. You usually have to blow torch that stuff and tar by its very nature is flammable. So the trick is to melt it without igniting it. And it's easy to mess that up, really easy to mess that up. Um, I've had several projects that have burnt because of that. Okay. So this is your slope symbol. Number A, letter A is your slope symbol. So let's go down, look at the answers of which we have a few. <laughs> the slope symbols we're looking at. It's pitch symbols, they have a name for it. Pitch or slope is the same thing. So fireworks says pitch symbol, and the correct the letter for that is A. Pitch symbol. This is the, um, the quiz. Section. This is the wall section quiz. Yep, the first one. Yep. Okay, that's one down. But we're getting terminology, okay? Letter B is, is pointing to our shingles, our finished roofing. Now, what can we put on a roof? What, what kind of things do we see on people's roofs? Shingles. shingles is the big, most common because it's the least expensive. And there's a range in shingles. So you can go from a 15-year shingle, which is the cheapest, to an 80-year shingle. That means you don't have to replace your roof. That lasts most people's lifetime. You can get to over 100 years if you go to a metal standing seam roof. And you see those mainly up in cabins. They're made out of aluminum, and then they're painted usually. And you can get any color you want. Be careful when you pick a color on aluminum. The sun bleaches it to colors you didn't want. Like teal goes to a moss green in about 10 years, which if you don't mind that color, it's fine. Um, but brown turns to pink like a really, really bright pink. Um, it's just the way the pigments in those paints are. So you do have to kind of think about what's the long term on that. So let's go down and find our shingles. It's up there at the top. Huh? Underneath pitch oh, is it right there? Oh, it's figures. So these are asphalt shingles. Asphalt is a tar product. It's the same stuff that's on your road. So you're just putting your road on your roof. And what that does is it um, lets the rock stick to it so you get a pretty effect to it. Mm -hmm. And we'll probably see them go and let you do some shinks. Moving down here. Okay, letter C. Try to make this a little bit bigger. Okay, letter C is pointing to the vertical board that's on the tails of the rafters. So the rafters, um, this is a truss system right here. And then the tail sticks out. We call that a rafter truss or a truss, depending on which way you want to go with it. 
if we leave the wood exposed on the inside, it's always called a rafter. Um, but this this little leg here that comes out that's on your sits on top of your roof is called the tail of the truss, and it's cut. And then there's a board that covers that up. Okay, so when we see that, they're like it looks like a ladder on the side of your house, and we put a fascia board called a fascia. F A S C I A is a fascia board that closes that off so that birds and squirrels and bats and bees and hornets and stuff don't get into your roof. And they still do anyway. Okay, so how big of a hole can a bat fit in? Probably like that. Size of a dime. Yeah. The bats we have in Utah will fit through a dime size hole. That's crazy. Um, they're all they're all pretty much barn bats that we have here. They're pretty benign. They do get rabies once in a while, but the problem is is their waist is heavy and they do a lot of it. So we want to keep them out. So letter C is your fascia board. And that's right um, above the pitch. That's your C. Okay. This is better than a PowerPoint anyway, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, D. What do you think D is? Uh, gutter. gutter. That's your gutter. Where are gutters required? So as you think about your plan designs. D. Okay, so as you think about how your house is going to be designed, where your roofs are going to go, where do you think a gutter is required? Uh, where, the side? Wherever, uh -huh. water will fall. wherever water will fall. So you have to look at what slope you have. If that water is coming off over a doorway, a, a gutter is required. That's the only place that's required. So if you got a slope coming off your front door or your garage or your back door, you have to put a gutter there. And why do we worry about that? Mold partial, it's mainly ice. We are in a very cold state, and it's gonna be really cold and really wet, and a lot of snow this year. Because why? It's 2020, why not? <laughs> Fomal's Armanek said it's gonna be one of the heaviest snowstorms we've had in the last 10 years. So excited. Yeah. It's an El Nino year. On top of everything else, we've had now hurricanes and fires and earthquakes and locusts, and we might as well just add snow. <laughs> the year of history. Oh, um, so because we get snow, and under law, if someone approaches your door, maybe they're a salesman or whatnot, and they slip and fall because there's ice on your stoop, your door, your stairs, they can sue you. Same with the sidewalk that's in front of your house that's not even yours. That belongs to the city. But if you don't keep it clear of snow and ice, someone falls like the mailman, mm -hmm. they can sue you. Okay, so we want to make sure we help protect the homeowner when we do our design. Um, most of the time we design things around it and we need just little small sections of gutter. I'm not a fan of gutters. They do bad things to your roof. They get full of ice. They pull off your shingles. Um, they're rough on your house. But we do have to keep those in mind. So letter D then is your gutter. And then this underside of the overhang of your roof. Notice this one's not very big. Your overhangs on your roof, we talked about that when we did that roof plan, six inches is the minimum. Okay, this one's just a little bit more, it's about a, almost a foot, but not quite. Um, what the whole purpose of this overhang is to provide shade to your house to keep it cool. So if they're too small, they don't do any good. If they're too wide out, then there's not enough heat coming out of the house to keep the ice from building up. And you get what's called an ice dam that builds on the edge of your roof and breaks your roof off because ice is heavier than snow. So we have to play this little game in Utah about how far out to extend and what to do about it. Now there's ways around that. We can put what, what's called heat tape, which means you run a, an electrical coil up on the side of your roof, which is great, but they don't last very long. They burn out, they get shorted out, um, you end up replacing them often. So the best is to design so you don't need that extra expense. The underside of an overhang is called a soffit. It's called a soffit. And it needs to be vented so the air goes up through the soffit and into your attic to get some of the heat out of there. And you also need like turtle vents. Yes, we do need turtle vents on top or, or gable vents, one of the two. So when we get to the roof, we're going to talk a lot about that venting. Has that been in the attic of your house? Mm -hmm. Every house has one. Some are not very big. How hot is it up there? 
really how. <laughs> yeah, in August, um, well, just this last, you were three digits. When it's 103 outside, it's 180 in your roof. That'll, that'll kill you if you're in there too long. So we have to vent that out. The other thing that happens is what happens to air when it gets hot in your roof? It expands. That pulls your roof apart, and then you get leaks. So airflow is really, really important. And the softening helps us do that. So that is letter E. And that'd be soffit overhang. And that'd be letter E. Okay, coming down the side, we're now at letter F. This is referring to the finish on the building itself. Um, I haven't said yet. Okay. Um, so right now, notice the difference between this symbol here and this one down here at I. It's the same wall, different finishes. So the one that F is pointing to is siding. And siding, it looks about the same in section view as stucco. It just siding is thinner. Okay. So it's really hard to tell those apart in a section view unless they're labeled. So let's go down and find siding. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, the F. Why did I not put these in order? Oh, because it's a quiz. It's supposed to make it hard. Things I do. Okay, so that's F is your siding. And there's different molds and trim work you can put into siding. Um, you cannot do, you can do the same thing with brick. You just have to treat it differently. And if you really like working with your hands a lot and you want to get into a pretty lucrative career and one that's going to definitely build your upper body is become a brick mason. If you learn how to cut brick and make it make a square brick into a round wall, you can make some bucks. Um, that's an old school technique that we have lost in the newer, younger masons. And so that's all we're doing is becoming square. If you look at old Victorian brick homes, they're gorgeous. The brickwork on those is amazing. But we don't have people willing to take the time to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with square buildings. But if you want to really put some quality into a profession and get into restoration, um, brick masons make a ton of money. And, and you always have a really good upper body. How would you get into that? Um, you start out as a hottie. It sounds great, right? <laughs> um, a hottie is H-A-U-T-Y. Um, that's the first, that's your starting position. A hottie is a person that hauls the brick and the mortar to the mason. And so literally, if they went to get on scaffolding, you're then throwing brick and mud to them. Uh -huh. And you would literally take a shovel full of mud and fling it, and they catch it. It's, it's a coolest thing in the world to watch. Um, likewise, you throw a bundle of brick and they catch it. So if you like to work out, that's that's where you start. Um, hotties make about 18 bucks an hour. And you usually only, if you work hard, you're usually a hottie for a season. It's a pretty quick promotion thing because it's like all things in construction, you prove yourself, you move pretty fast. Okay, moving down to G. Golly G. That's a hard arrow to see where it's pointing. Okay. Insulation. Yeah, it's the insulation. So G is actually pointing to the insulation in the wall. Um, all of our walls we did out two by six studs in order to try and get to the R34 that's required for wall insulation. In 1978, we only needed an R13. We've doubled it, um, almost tripled it now. Um, with an R13, you could use a two by four stud. It was really easy to do. We could get six inches of bad insulation, the Owens Corning pink fiberglass stuff, mm -hmm. and we we're fine. Now we've got to get really creative on how we insulate these buildings. So if we're not careful, the code inspectors will make us insulate the outside of the building. And that's wasting money. Because anytime a kid hits their ball against the house, they dent it. And once you compress insulation, it loses its value. So um, we want to watch that. So G is insulation. And if I get any of these wrongs, I'll fix the grade. So okay. H is referring to the information between insulation. Thank you. Okay. 
H is referring to the inside um, between the stud wall and the brick. Now, when we build our walls, remember we have our sheathing, then there has to be a one inch vapor barrier between wood and brick. Because if you ever put a brick in water, they, they, uh, one brick can hold in two gallons of water because they're made out of clay and they just soak it in. It's just baked clay. Just because it's baked doesn't mean it doesn't soak in water. And so we've got to be able to keep that water from leaking onto wood because what happens if wood gets wet? Mold, and it's the, not the good mold. It's that black mold that when it blooms, we all get sick and some people die. So we want to protect against that. So if we're looking at H, we're looking at sheathing. I'm thinking is what I put down there. <laughs> no, it's not sheet rock. It's the air gap. Some of the air gaps. So I didn't put sheet in that, so it's the air gap. So remember with brick, there has to be that one inch air gap. Same with stone. And stucco is a little different. Stucco sits on foam insulation. So that works as the vapor, bar vapor barrier there. But stone and brick both have the air gap. I didn't put the alphabet in order. Jeez. Yeah. This, this was supposed to be so hard. Okay, now coming down here, I then is our brick or masonry. That symbol is used for both brick and stone. Um, in this case, if we're showing brick, we would draw and Revit will do for you each brick. But this is just the general masonry symbol. And that's going to be probably brick on this. But. Brick veneer. Brick veneer. It's at the very top. Of course it is. <laughs> so this is supposed to randomize. It's all good. It's H I. Okay, now, what if you don't want the weight of all that brick? So bricks are about three and seven eighths, three and five eighths, depending on who makes them, wide, and that's got to sit and be supported by your wall. Uh -huh. So that's some weight. Okay, is there, do you think we have another solution to that for your exterior wall? And this is something you can think about when you go back and edit your walls on what you do. You can get the same look of brick if we use what's called a soap, S-O-A-P. And what they do is they take brick that had been damaged. So how do, you, how do they make brick? Let's go with that first. It's baked. And if you want to see those ovens, if you go down to Lehigh, there's interstate brick just to the east of the freeway. They've got these big cement domes that look like igloos. Those are the brick ovens. So the brick is stacked in there, and then it's heated up. Well, the bricks that are inside the stack are not going to get as hot as the bricks on the outside. And the bricks on the outside are going to get really hot. Okay, so what happens is those outer level of bricks, they tend to explode and crack. And so those tend to be rubble, and they get recycled and rebuilt. And then the middle layer, those are really good ones. Those are for the finishes of the exterior. And then the inside ones are baked a little longer, and they become fire brick. And fire brick goes in fireplaces because it's been heated twice. So it's like tempered, and so it can hold heat better. Well, these ones they, they damage, they'll cut, and they cut them off in quarter-inch pieces. And they just cut that edge off, and then they glue them back on the wall. So instead of having a full four-inch brick, they're just a little thin piece. Is it like an inch? They don't be about an inch with the grout. Yeah, it's somewhere about a half inch. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see them on HDTV now. They've moved from the outside into the inside, mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. they put them in like tile, but it's just, they're called soaps, they're brick soaps, and they're just put on there, and they give the same look without the weight. And weight's a big deal. We have to worry about the weight of a building, because some of our soil won't hold the whole building. And then when the earth shakes, bad things happen. And we've got to be aware of that. Okay, so come on down. You're just in this lecture a week early. It's okay, okay um, H, I, where's J? J's down here. Okay, now this symbol right here, this is earth. And this symbol is a little different. I'm gonna give you the versions of that again. Yeah. J. Well, what are you talking about? Aren't you listening? We're on the letter J is what we're talking about.
Okay. Both of these symbols are for Earth. Okay, the one here on the left, this is undisturbed soil. So what that means is God did that. Okay, Lucas, you need to sit down, sir. I know. Okay, so this is the earth in its natural raw state. Okay, and that means it's understood. That means what's happened is over time, rain has compacted that soil, and it's as strong as it's going to get. We can't improve upon it. If we move dirt around, we have to go through and compact it. And the term you'll see on drawings is 95% of proctor. Well, you're the proctor. You're becoming like God, is that what that word kind of means, which you're not, but we use it. And you then try to get to 95% of what God did, or nature did, or the cosmos did, whatever realm you want to work in. So this shows us compacting it. And we can do that in a couple ways. We can do that with just putting a, a steamroller over it, which is the best way. And then you'll see some contractors that are kind of lazy, <laughs> they'll just run a hose on it. That's the worst way to do it, okay? Because that water that you're saturating that soil with is now in contact with your foundation and keeping it too wet, okay? So we want to make sure we compact it properly and, and you don't want them to just run the hose, okay? because it's not consistent and you get weakened soil, okay? So both of those are the same symbol. They just change the orientation to show what's involved, okay? So that makes J earth. So that, so that one in there. So just K, K is the bottom of our wall. It is called the footing. It's the foot, the foot's the bottom. Um, now, they have a rule of thumb. And we'll be doing your foundation walls after your second floors. If those are second floors, I have to get those done. Okay. We do all the up above ground first before we do below down. And the reason we do it that way, we have to know the weight of your house. So the foundation is determined on how much your house weighs. Aren't you so glad you get to figure that out? So fortunately, we have some tables and charts to make that a little easier now. Um, the footing has a rule of thumb, is three times as wide as your foundation. So if your foundation wall is an eight inch thick wall, then your footing is two foot thick, two foot wide, okay? Then the depth, the vertical distance, um, is anywhere from 10 inches to 12 inches. If you want to be safe, do 12, let your engineer say 10 inches is enough. Okay. The reality is, when they make these, no one's making them nice and square like this. No one does that. There, there's forms that you're just paying extra money for it. What they do is they take their backhoe and they dig a trench. They put the rebar down in it and they fill it with concrete. So these dimensions here, we'll put those up above. So when you have your footing, and it's going to be 24 inches by 12, that dimension is the minimum allowed. When reality is, they'll probably put a 30 inch wide bucket on the backhoe, and they'll dig a trench that's like that, and they'll fill the whole thing. Okay? That, that's just what they're going to do. And so you're safer as long as they meet these minimum requirements. So engineers give you the minimums. If you go beyond that, cool. Because the number one lawsuit in the United States is in construction. The second one's over water, third one's over money. So it all kind of starts with your design. And so you really want to make sure it's designed um, properly and you have it thick enough. But it's just going to be filled with concrete and uh, whatever shape it is. And nice things about but good backhoe drivers will make a pretty decent trench. It's not going to be too terrible. Okay? Now, on this image, you're going to see a little notch at the bottom of the wall. You see a little notch there? Yes. That's an old, old, old technique. It's called a keyway. And what they do is they lay a two by four down in the middle of the concrete before it sets. And then they rip that out for the wall. We don't do that anymore. What we found, we used to think, well, that's just like Legos. It's going to lock the house together, right? It makes sense. Mm -hmm. But anytime you have a corner in concrete, you've created a crack point. And so it would crack from these corners and remove the strength of your footing 
And so it doesn't do so well. And we found that out in California primarily, um, right. earthquakes. And then the house just kind of slips off its footing. You can't fix that. That's the tensile strength. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Because you've got rebar coming up through here, and we'll, we'll put that all in your drawings. So it'll be all good. Okay, L right here is a concrete slab. So this is the basement floor. It is always, let's find basement slab. One L. I did get that. The four inch concrete slab. Yep. For, um, K is your footing. Did I not do footing one? I thought you did do footing. Where did the footing go? So this one's L. And there's my. Yeah, oh, just there. Okay, K is your country. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Okay, so that gets us to L. M then becomes what? What would you call M? foundation wall. Now, when you get into Revit, this is where it gets a little confusing. Revit calls the footing the foundation. I don't know why. No one in the chat rooms can explain it, but they, when you build the footing in Revit, it will be called the foundation and the wall will be called the wall. It's, the it's, wall. it's a little frustrating that way, but this is the foundation wall. If the wall is out of concrete below grade, it's a foundation. Okay. And then the footing goes underneath the foundation. So M goes there. There. N is our floor joist. Now, these that are shown here are engineered lumber floor joists, engineered joists. Um, we typically call those a TJI. That's a manufacturer name. It comes from Trust Joyce McMillan. Trust Joyce, Trust Joyce McMillan is a German company that bought out an American company called Boise Cascade. Uh, Boise Cascade owns, McMillan owns, probably 90% of the Intermountain Northwest. So all those things are on fire right now. It's around Portland, Seattle, um, all that. Those are farmed trees. They run it just like a cornfield. Um, they cut them down, they plant new ones, and they rotate the crop, and they manage it very, very well. It's not like South America where we just bull things, bulldoze everything down, and then leave it. We, we manage our forests very, very well in the United States. So if you get involved in some of these um, groups like Sierra Club, they'll say otherwise, but fly over the forest and see how they're managed. You can see that very well, and it, we do very well there. Are they going to go bankrupt? Um, no, they won't. Um, the thing about pine trees, con coniferous trees where we get our lumber from, they like fire. They like it a lot. Like the ash. They like the ash. They like the nutrients from it. And a lot of the white pine, they have to burn in order to give off their seeds. What likes fire? Trees. The trees. The trees in the, the mountains. So some of the trees, they need the fire to produce the seeds, and the seeds help to replace the forest. So usually if you look at a pine tree, if it burns the bark, it'll recover from that usually pretty well, especially a fast-moving fire like we have right now. The ones in Oregon and, and Washington are a little different than California. California's fires are quite a bit different. Um, California is a very much a leave-it-as-it-is state, and, and you'll probably hear this in the news, so let me explain it to you. What's happening? California does not go in and clear up the brush that falls. In uh, from Utah, Idaho, Washington, Nevada, um, Oregon, Montana. When we send people out to get permits for firewood, that's the wood they get. Is they clean up trees that have fallen down, they clean up the brush, which is all good. Okay, it helps keep fires from burning too long in one place. They move through very quickly, and the forest recovers very fast. California's chosen not to do that, and that's what the president's talking about, is they just don't, they let, let nature do its own thing. Well, 
nature will fix itself. It, it does. And I want you to keep this in mind. Uh, one thing we have learned, and I don't care what political side you are, one thing we've learned from COVID is that three months of the world stopping fixes everything. Our ozone layer is repaired. Our ocean life is recovering. Um, it fixes a lot of things. Three months is all it takes for our country, our, our, our country, our planet to reset. And that's an amazing thing. We didn't know that. We did not know that before. And that's one thing we do know now is that we can improve the environment very, very quickly if we all do it together. In this case, the planet forced us to. So she will take care of herself. I promise you she will. Um, but um, we're all getting, it's a, it's a good thing. Our air is never been as clean as air now. And that's kind of weird, except now we're full of smoke. Right. Yeah. Um, but what does smoke do in the atmosphere? Is there a good thing to smoke in our atmosphere? It helps our ozone. Carbon that comes off smoke helps to scrub the atmosphere. So while it's bad right now, as that spreads out, it kind of scrubs the atmosphere the same way it does water. If you take charcoal out of your fireplace or your campfire, and then you put that at the bottom of your jar and then put some sand on top of that, and then you pour dirty water through it, by the time it comes out the bottom, it's drinkable. And that's that's what carbon does. That's what makes us. So it's like there's some good out of everything. You just have to take the time to learn. Okay. All right. So if we're not using engineered joists like these, these are I beams. What I beams? We can use dimensional lumber. It's much, much more expensive. So these are about 11 and 7 eighths of an inch tall, almost 12 inches. But if we do dimensional lumber, we'd be using a 14 inch piece to get the same strength. That means we're using older trees, which is a lot harder to farm and maintain. So we want to use engineered woods when we can. These are made from scraps. These are really made from scraps. In fact, I have one of these. That's a good thing to know. It's like plywood. Kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like plywood. Uh, those of you that are online are not going to be able to see this because it's too gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so N, then what's the answer for N? Uh, four joists. Four joists, yep. And whether it's engineered or dimensional lumber, it's the same thing, call it the same thing. The big thing you're going to struggle with is keeping joists and truss separate in your head. That's going to be the tricky part, okay? Okay, then above your joist, letter O, is called a subfloor. This is made out of plywood, typically. Could be made out of OSB or a strand board. Um, do not, do not let your contractor make it out of particle board. Does anyone know what particle board is? No, it's what your tables are made out of. Um, yes, particle board is literally, it's sawdust and glue. That's all it is. So we take all the sawdust from the mill, we put it in a big old vat, pour some glue in, mix it up, and press it out into blanks. What happens when that gets wet? It blooms. It just, boom. Do not let them use that for flooring. Okay? Warp. Yeah, it warps the floors. If you've got pets, you're really screwed. If you've got overflowing t tubs or you spill a glass of wine, doesn't matter what the liquid is, that stuff's just going to bloom and go everywhere. Okay? So this is your subfloor, is O. Subfloor. Okay, making progress. Ooh, hoo, hoo. This has got about seven different PowerPoints doing it this way. Kind of cool. All right, letter P is referring to this little base molding right here. Say, so, you no, know, around the room, can you see the base molding here? It's kind of ugly. It's called a rubber base mold. And it's really ugly. Um, if you look down in the new entryway, they're putting tile base molds, but you can use carpet, you can do wood. What does base molding do? What's it for? It covers, gap it covers the gap between the drywall and the floor. 
drywall never goes all the way down to the bottom. It, there's always a little bit of a rough get, get, sometimes it's a rough edge, hopefully not, but there's always a gap and it kind of helps cover up that gap. Um, you have to have some kind of base mold. There's a, also a crown mold that goes across the top. That's completely optional. And that can be very, very expensive and very, very decorative, mm -hmm. but you do have to have a base mold. And that's what that is. Um, they, they don't have to be very tall. You can, most homes with now, the modern movement is a two inch molds, very, very small. Um, I've seen them as tall as 14 inches. They're crazy, but they're usually in people who are trying to hide money in their house. What does that mean to hide money in your house? You're, extremely rich. you're very rich. And if you put money in a house, you can't be taxed. And so when you go up to Park City, a lot of those homes are really tax shelters. They've taken their wealth, put it into a home. They live in it once a week, one, one week a year, but they can write it off in their taxes. And that's that's probably the easiest way to keep the government out of your money is to have a second home. Surprising enough, but you to take a risk. What's your risk? The home prices. Drop. The home prices drop. How big of a risk is that? Right now they keep rising. Pretty minor, pretty yeah. pretty small risk. Residential property has never taken a huge drop of more than five percent. So even back in 2018, when everything dropped. Home prices didn't drop that much. They dropped by 5%. And now they recouped that from 2018 to 2020. They now, here's I'll tell you this. My house was worth 157,000 in 2018. It's now worth 340,000. It doubled. It doubled in, in those two years. Yeah. My grandparents, um, they're like, uh, they're going to sell their house. And my grandma's house. Salt Lake, okay. The heart of South Salt Lake. And it's got a basement and it's, you know, it's a pretty big house, but it's not that big. Not huge, yeah. And she bought it for like, you know, my grandparents bought it in the 50s. So she probably paid 30000 for mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. it's like 340000 Yeah. So yeah. not a bad way to retire, right? Yeah. So ho housing is a good deal. And if you can get into rental units, that's even better. But you, you want to start young. Don't try and get in rail units when you're old. It's too almost too late because you don't have the energy to keep up with it. But yeah, so there's good things there. Q is your drywall, sheetrock, um, what's the other word? Gypsum board. So Q is, oh goodness, it keeps sticking on me. Right there. Drywall, all that good stuff. This mold. Okay, now moving on up, we got um, R. This one's really kind of a weird deal, okay? If you remember when we built our walls, um, we put them up, um, they're about eight feet tall. Uh -huh. They're 84, it was 84 inches? 96 inches, yeah, I can't remember that. I can read my file, 84. Okay, that's the stud. So that's this part of the wall from the bottom of the X down to the top of the next X. At the bottom of the wall, this one's called a sole plate, S-O-L-E. There's a sole plate there. That's like the bottom of your shoe. At the top of the wall, there are two top plates. Mm -hmm. So that's going to add another three inches to your height. And that's to give it the strength to hold the gypsum board on there. Uh, keep that up in the spot. Now, when you put your top plates on, do you have to have two top plates on interior walls? No, you don't. But you end up doing that so you don't have sloped ceilings. Yeah. So while it's not required you have double top plates on the interior walls, we do it to keep the ceilings flat. Now, if you're vaulting, that, that negates that. If you're just doing a flat ceiling, you would put top plates there to make it even. Um, the bottom of your floor joist down here, there's another X right down below. That's called a mud seal. And it's always made out of either redwood or pressure treated lumber. So anybody know what pressure treated lumber looks like? Okay, it's usually green. It's got a green tint to it. It usually has lots of little holes in it, little rectangular holes. What they've, what they've done is they've soaked it in pesticides so that termites don't eat it. 
then they pressure treat it with um, see, with the moisture resistant chemicals. So there's two main chemicals, uh, moisture resistant and pesticides. That gets under pressure. They inject it into the wood. So it's all these holes where they've impregnated it. It's a weird word, but so it is. And so when you're out camping, that is not wood you put on a campfire. There are so many toxins in that wood that the smoke alone will make you loopy. Okay. So if you get this greenish wood with a whole bunch of little holes in it that are all the same size, same shape, and equal space, don't burn that. Okay. Just don't burn it. It's not good. But that is the mud seal. And that's that does does that sit right on the concrete? No. Even though it's been treated, we cannot put wood ever on concrete. Underneath that is what was once an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch of vapor barrier, a piece of styrofoam that goes underneath it. By the time the full way of the house is on that paper, it's less than 0.01 millimeters thick. It just mashes down. But that has to go down in order to keep moisture out of that wood. Okay? So double top plates. Another thing you need to remember on top plates, you cannot have a seam where two boards come together over a doorway. Okay? So if it's going to go, if it's a doorway, your seam has to move over. So you have to reposition how you cut that wood. Mm -hmm. And then you can't have the bottom top plate and the top top plate have the seam line up. So that would be. So that would be like offset. Yeah, that'd be offset. So you can't do that. You have to offset them by two feet. So this would be clear over here. So there's got to be two foot offset between seams. So you don't buckle your roof. That would take some thinking. Take some thinking. They'll take some little planning. So usually what they'll do is they'll start on one corner of the house and put the first top plate down. Let's so start in the opposite corner and do the second top plate. And that usually will jog them enough on that. Okay? So R is a double top plate. I didn't get the gutter in there either. Man, I'm the slacker. And double top plate. My letter's out. That leaves us with one last one, and that is S, and that is called the J-bolt. It's also called a hook bolt. Um, they do not have to be J-shaped. They used to be. Um, you can actually do it with a, um, a nut and a washer now. So this is to make sure the building is tied down to the concrete foundation. Yeah, we put the bend in it so it doesn't slide out. Or you can take a threaded rod and put a washer and a bolt and so it can't pull out. And as long as we've done that, we're good. Is that like embedded in the cement? It's embedded, so it goes in the cement before it sets. We leave the top portion above it. Then when that, that's got to be tall enough, it goes all the way through the mud seal. And then we put a bolt on top of that and crank it down. And then if there's any left sticking above that, sometimes they'll cut those off, usually not, because then no one's ever going to see it. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's your anchor bolt. Uh, but the bend helps. Again, you want it so it doesn't pull out. Um, what would pull a house out of the foundation? Yeah. High wind. We just yeah. went through that, right? So you guys went through um, what would be experienced on the coast. Yeah. Um, we were a Category 2 hurricane here in Salt Lake and Davis and Weaver counties. Isn't that crazy? So the it's the same category as Category 2 hurricane. I was playing golf. It's pretty crazy wind, right? You, um, so what happens, that those are all Canadian winds, which is what's because we've moved into El Nino. And so the whole climate shifted. And so all the cold air came out of the north. And that's what, happened, what it did. Um, so we had a big pocket of hot water now in the Pacific. And that's what shifted everything. And um, so typically what causes valley winds, and we get them all day long, we're usually doing um, 90 to 120 mile an hour winds um, daily in Utah. So when the valley in the morning, the valley is nice and cool. As the valley heats up, that hot air goes up the mountains. Okay, so, so the winds are all going up the canyons. Then in the evening, as the mountains are now hot, the valley's cooling off, it reverses and blows back down. 
So the worst place to be is um, Weber Canyon. The winds there are often 90 to 120 mile an hour winds during rush hours. And that's the rough one, okay? So all good stuff to know in your design, whether you're doing commercial, residential, or beginning on there, okay? So there's one down. Let's, um, I want to go ahead and move to the next one as well. Did we miss one? S is the J bolt. S is your J bolt. You should all have a perfect score now. Life's good. And if not, it will be. Okay. I'm going to move to the next one, which is the wall component. Uh, mainly just to talk about because it's easier for you to see on your screen than for me to try and show a PowerPoint because I'm already losing seven of you. Okay, this image right here is in every architecture design book ever, ever made. It's just one. So I want you to know that because of that, this is also the same image you're going to see on the state test because it's not in copyright anymore. Okay, that's the plus about that. Now, what we're looking at here is labeling these parts. I'm just going to spend time on the one picture, and I'll tell you what the parts are, and you can go and scroll through them, okay? Okay. Now, each of these parts has specific names. So since we're on the header, the header is this portion over the window. Your doors also get a header. That's often a little bit different design, but the header is what goes over an opening, okay? So the header is number three. So you want to scroll down and find three there. I'll just scroll through, it's just as easy. Okay, now we talked about there being a sole plate. That's the bottom. That'll be number six here. That's the sole plate. But underneath your window is a seal plate, and that's number four. Now, I want to be very careful about how you we address this, okay? When you put your windows in your house, Remember I said you have to pick on the inside of the wall? Okay, a window has two different names for that bottom portion. The seal of the window is on the outside. That's the window seal. So when you look at the bottom horizontal of a window on the outside of the house, that's the seal. It seals it up. Yeah. On the inside, it's called a window stool. And the window stool can be enlarged to become a window seat. Does that make sense? So it's a stool on the inside, it's a seal on the outside. So when you place your windows, it's important to put those in the right way. Okay. Um, how many have window seats in your house? Do you have a window seat? A couple of you still. They're, they're kind of coming back into style right now. They were like Yeah, they're, they're getting really big, actually. Um, they're usually in bay windows or pop-out windows, but they're making a comeback in the design world, mainly because people are finding that Reading's a good thing again. Kind of have to go figure that. Okay, so four is your seal plate. The stud. Now this gets really, really crazy. There are lots of studs in this picture. Mm -hmm. There's only one true stud, and that's number one. It's all by itself. It's all by itself. That's a stud. Studs are always alone. Okay. There might be a metaphor in life about that. <laughs> Haven't quite sure, but yeah, I think that's probably the case because. All the, all the old football studs that I went to high school with are all divorced and single now. So there's probably some truth to that. Um, okay, so I'm going to just kind of go through these names a little bit. So the stud is by itself. That's number one. A stud next to a window or a door that's supporting that opening is called a king stud. Okay, and that's the king. Then if you look at number two right here, it's kind of supporting the header. It's the one next to the window or the door. I don't know. I'm just I'm just teaching right now. Okay. So number seven is the king on this one. Number two is a trimmer. It's cut to trim the opening. Okay. That should make a little bit of sense. Um, there are some um, old time contracts that still call that a jack stud. So you might see that interchangeably if you're working out in the field. That's so not, two is either a trimmer or a jack. It's not the cripple jack, though, right? 
No, the cripples are down here. They're really, really. Just a minute, Lucas, I'll get to it, okay? Okay, so for this question number three, you're looking for the stud, that's um, number one. Number four is the cripple jack. That are these guys down here, that's number five. So these are underneath a window. Um, they can be various lengths, that's why they're called cripples. I um, usually won't see jack with them. We're kind of dropping the jack off of terminology right now. Uh, but these cripples go underneath an opening to just kind of short up. Uh, you might also see them in what's called a pony wall or in some kind of stair banisters. Uh, there's also, um, they're also on your fascias of your house and your soffits. So they're just small pieces of wood used to support. So that's number five is your cripples. So five, notice there's also cripples above the window as well. So they're above and below. Okay, the trimmer is number two. That's what's holding up the header. That's number five. Number six, the, mo the sole plate, that is number six. You will see people confuse that with mud seal. Please don't. Mud seal is near the foundation. It is not in the walls that are the house. Okay, they're only, mud seals only exist on exterior walls. That's our place you'll find them. Okay, but this is your sole plate. Right number here, this little bottom single guy all sits on the subfloor. It's all nice and pretty like. Number seven, the top plates, that is number eight. Double top plates there. You gotta give you a break here just a second. <laughs> Number eight, the king stud is number seven. Eight. Eight. Okay. And number nine. All right. This is a little bit of a tricky question. So um, I want to explain this to you. In a basement, you can have a seven foot ceiling. It's not a good idea <laughs> for lots of reasons, but you can go down that low in a basement. Uh, most of you who are approaching five nine can reach a seven foot ceiling, okay? Um, my room, I live in the basement. Uh-huh. And I don't have a ceiling, I'm six Yeah, so your door's right there, yeah. That means that you will not have a ceiling fan, right? You just, you won't, okay? So you can have a seven foot um, ceiling in a basement. In the rest of the house, you're looking at eight feet as being your minimum, okay? Now that's, you can go higher. You can go 20 feet if you want. Um, if you're willing to pay for it, you can do it, but you do have to have at least eight feet. Why do you think the difference is on the main floor and seven floor we go eight feet? Why do we change that? Ideas why we want to have that different. Yeah. yeah, it's mainly for getting appliances and stuff in. Um, the uh, that's the main reason the kitchen. If your most refrigerators are about six feet tall, um, which is a small refrigerator. We've got refrigerators now that are approaching eight feet. If you get the big double sided ones, they're huge. Um, but the other thing that really affects that is the amount of air that's in those spaces. Your basements tend to not be your main congregating area of the house. You might have a family room down there, but usually if you bring guests over, they're gonna be on that main floor. And we need enough volume of air to expel out CO2. Because you get enough people in a room, we can use up that oxygen pretty quick. And so it's about air changes, it's about light, the amount of light we need to stay healthy, um, all those kind of things. So. Our minimum wall height is seven, is eight feet. Um, number ten. Uh, to get the rough opening, we add two inches to the finish opening. That's it's actually four. Okay, you have to have two inches on each side because you got to remember you're you're adding in that that trimmer piece. So is it true? It's false. Okay. It should be false. I'm I'm questioning if I've got that right yeah. in there now. So if you missed that one, I'll fix it, okay? okay. 
but she, it is true. Uh, yeah, I'll, so Can't we just you should be able to change if you haven't submitted. Change it to true and you'll be fine. You really want to think about trimmers on both sides and your trimmer is an inch and a half, but you need that on each side of your, of your okay? All right, let's, um, we're gonna take a break because you guys should have a break. Um, let's come back at 20 to one. If you need to go get water, restrooms, hit the vending machines, let's do a, a little break there. Come back at 20 minutes too. So when the big hand's on the eight, we can't do digital. Yes. I just have a question about my windows. Sure. So on my design, I have these big glass windows. Big glass windows. Yep. But I can't find any. You have to put up. So you look at a first glass window. And is it this one right here? Oh yeah. And then I just have them all over the place. It's okay. Custom windows. So what I would use for those is so this is your fixed window right here, and right now you got to paste it right here. So if you go in here and edit, and you know what size you want those windows to be. So you've got some three belt sizes in here, so four foot by six foot. Because those are decorative windows, you can create those to whatever size you want. Just remember to duplicate and then change your dimensions. So get them in here in inches. In this format, and then you just change your width and your size. <laughs> the, the the, what we'll have to do is we need to wait on that until after we get your roof because we don't want to okay. So that we so I would do your low window first, and then your upper. So I'm, yeah, so those are the main that almost the same window. But, um, yeah, so just kind of go with what you feel like. You can also make a change. And a lot of options just start looking for exterior finishes where you want to change those. So yeah, just go with the fixed one and make it true. It's good, but they did fix it on the screen. Oh, and what they put. The material of the out, material outside of the house. That is, um, that's actually a green brick. It is. Um, you can go stuck with that very easily, which is true what I would suggest. Um, and then use your roll part here, probably do that in stone. I'm not sure if it's possible. Okay. Yeah, fun on stuff. It's a little bit of that green brick's too. Right? It's a very Midwestern thing. What they do is they glaze the brick. So just like in pottery class, they put a glaze on it and then they bake it. And so you get these weird colors because you're going much hotter than what your pottery goes. Are you guys online doing okay? No. Yeah, I'm doing good. That's great. I apologize for not having software today. I've got to figure out what's going on there. Yes, oh, great one. Okay, so. There's a beam. There's a big beam there, or an archway, or it could be even some decorative type of element. So when when we get into the interiors, we'll start dressing those up. So would I add a wall there? Just put a wall in. I put the whole wall in. And just remember, you got to come back and open that up. Yep, we're getting to where we're getting to some nitty gritty fixes. Are you in architecture too? You're one. Anything else I need to do in my house? Around there too. Sometimes you turn those monitors and come plug them in. Yeah. Is this the bath here? Yeah. You so might I get the bigger walls. Okay. Yeah, you might want your door to swing into the bath. Okay. It's a little, little bit more able to. And the reason being that is you can prop your foot and cold close if you need to, depending on where your water closet is. Yeah. But we can flip that around. There, that, that's a, a flexible wall. Yeah. And I had to like edit this wall. Yeah, that's down, good. So there wasn't enough room for this door. Yep. So the closet's are really tight. The other thing you could do, if you choose, is you could pull this wall down another foot. And that's just pretty simple. 
Yeah. So that's a choice you can make. You can definitely do that. Okay. Or even two feet if you wanted. Because mm -hmm. this looks. What size is this bedroom? Uh, Going to modify. Yeah, and do that guy. Mm -hmm. Just poke inside. Oh, let me show you another way. Let's get you fancy. So if we change this down to. Oh, Um, oh, it's on the new version. Oh, it's not. Yet. I gotta get one. Yeah, you're kind of tight. Yeah. Uh, ten by ten, your smallest. So go ahead and pull this wall down, okay. and we can do that with the stretch or the move. You want to work? Which one do you want to do? I'll just do it. Okay, so we're going to move window all of that. Now you pick a point and then go down. I'd go down probably two feet with it. <clears throat> yes, question time. All right, so uh, is the red one you want to all three or you? Turned off periodically. And you want to make sure you have Project Browser, that's what you have here, and the properties is what you see. There you go. That's what you need, right? Okay. Yep. If you have questions on your plans that I can answer real quick, you should come back. Now that I've actually that is a fireplace. That is a big old fashioned wood burning fireplace. That is a big old part. So right now, if you want to put that as a wall, we'll put those kinds of configurations. Yeah, that's just a big old grand fireplace. So if you want to do a wood burning fireplace, you want to do a glass. So that is what. So we'll show that as a wall right now. Yeah.
change. So the easy fix to this is to use this one right here actually. Okay. And then I got this thing I'm a little more space for garage. Okay, now this garage is too far if you want to do a double pry, you can do that. We'll just move this block over and that works in. So yeah, you're good. Yeah, so you're supposed to. Do I have to put this back in? No, oh, sorry, no, it's working. Yeah, yeah we're going to. Okay, you want to go through a look at things like this. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to thin lines so you can see those lines better. And what you do is modify the line here. I'm going to go to the face. So I hit this line here and then that edge. So I look for those to disappear. You want to make sure your walls are lined up. Okay. So that's what I do. Go through and line your walls up. So they're all where you want them to be. Okay. This should be an extra wall right here. And it jumps up. So we just take that out there. And then use your corner tool. And use corner tool. Now, you see how the lines are? This is the outside of the So the walls are the same. Okay? Yeah, they are. So if you just click on them, you see the arrows? And flip it, but remember you have it that way, so you don't want to change your space and move it back in a way. Okay? So this will clean up. Cool, clean up time. Why are you not working on the project, buddy? Stay focused. Hey, buddy, what? I'm going to bring back the site. Oh, you lost all your control. Okay, yeah, do you remember that we talked about last week? No, we went to sleep then. The view. You are the user. This is how you interface with it, right? Okay, you want to make sure your project browser and your properties. Now, what's happened here is they've both been expanded, so they're overlapping each other. So that's your. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to rebuild it. They're just the windows that slide around. So that's going to go there. And then this guy, kind of get it right in the right spot. Yep, you're good. You too, sir. Look at all these questions. Oh, cool. Well, let me go get the online kids working again, and I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, online, we're going to go into a lab right now. I'm going to help kids fix their walls. If you want to go ahead and just work on your drawings and then let me know if you have questions, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, clean up the walls. All right, I'm going to come down here with you. And we're going to do some settings here so you can see things a little bit. Right here, if you have a fine detail. 
Yeah, let's okay them. That's okay. So that gives us an idea where we put. So it's some right, some wrong. So we click on this guy and we split it. Okay. So that's not a huge problem there. Okay. I'm also going to go into your view. I'm going to get rid of those really thick lights right now. So now you can see the chips more. Like that. I'm going to go back to modify. I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to go not the center of the wall, but to the wall faces. And then cancel out and go back to the view. This is there. And I want this wall to line up with this end. Right? So we take this line, then this line, and snap it together. So we'll do this one and this one. And so it takes two seconds. It goes really, really quick. So just flip your walls and look where you have it. Okay? Good job. It looks good. Mm -hmm. Looks really good. Next question. Well, oh, put it over there. Yes, sir. Um, What's that? Yeah, you said that. Did you know one to you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. I have the wrong side. Okay. I will have to, let me send you another one tonight. Will you send me an email to fix your profile? Send it up and I'll send it. Because I, I can't get the software now. Okay, now you're doing doors. Okay, so you're doing your doors. Okay. So pick the door you want here. So usually it could be 80 inches of those six foot eights, 84 or so up here. So just keep it consistent. Okay, then you get. So 30 inches is a two foot six, 32 is a two foot eight, 34 is a two foot 10, 36 is a two foot 10. Uh huh. Yep. Just make sure your front door or this one, that needs to be three feet. But everything else will be okay. Just reply to this and say wrong version. So you're just going to do, just do a snippet of that and work a screenshot of that. Okay. That's it. And then also for my head height, like when I do the head height, uh -huh. uh, that's the Yeah, you just have a head height. Um, just okay. Usually it's a seal. Okay, so what that's saying is up to all the windows, three feet. The window is four feet. So that's like showing you how to have a step. So that's correct. So this, did you change that number? Yeah, so that's what I have to do. But then I look at it in the That's just the windows here. One minute, buddy. You're not the only one in the class. So just be patient. I told you I'll be there just a second. So we have to sell it where we want to be. We have here, it's a one foot tall window. So we don't need to six when we're going. Okay. Yeah. So just put the cell in So that's a change this one. So you could do a five eight there if you wanted to do it up. Okay. Yep. Yep. 
Oh my goodness. Just one second, I'll get you off. Yes, Lucas. What are you doing? We're not in there anymore. We're not I know. Not point five. Okay. Going around the horn. So I never saved correctly because all my walls are just wonky. They're wonky? All the work I did on them. Oh, no. All right. Let me see what version you've got open. Okay. Where are you saved up? Uh, my you computer? In, yeah. Right. You in your drive here? Yeah. This one? You renamed it? You went and called it. So if I was to find where this is said, what would that be? Oh, out uh, here. Is it you? Yeah. Is this the one you opened? Yeah. Okay, this is the backup. You actually want to go to this one here. Um, so this would be the one you want to open up here. Because that's the back of this one. So let me do this. These numbers are the back of versions. So this is your template. This is your project. So I'm going to open this one because it's a bit green. Is this better? Uh, this is like a previous version. So we're back. Okay, so what's happening is you're overriding your backups, and so your backups are disappearing. So let me talk that to everybody because that's a good thing to okay. tell everybody. So you have to just go off of this one now, and then we fix that. Um, when you guys open up your route files, some of them will have like a dot zero zero one zero zero two. Don't open those. Those are your backups. You open the file without the dots zero zero. Okay. So it's got a number on it, don't open that one. Open the one that doesn't have the numbers. Otherwise, you're going to be overwriting. Every time there's a save, it's an overwrite for what you've done. And you're not getting there. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, yeah, you have a question too, sir? Okay. So I got in there. Um, we don't really know what room that is because there's no wall. Is this the open plan? The, um, the big open space. Yeah. Okay, let's just jump into 3D. Can I get something left? And let's zoom up there a little bit. Yes, they look correct. Yep, looks good. Right. Okay, so try to clean your walls up. You can be pushing on windows and doors if you do that. Okay, do any of you guys online have any questions? Hey, Chloe, it's good to see you. No. Okay, let's see. Um, Omar, is this the one you just sent me? Huh? Okay, I'll get that fixed for you. Okay. Looks good. So, again, watch your walls. Make sure your corners are all lined up the way you want them to be. Make sure you go in and check and make sure you don't have your walls inside out. There's very few of you have that. So, it's a tricky thing to do. And it's it's normal. Okay. With mine, there's like this weird wall. You got a weird wall? Not the weird wall. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, like, okay, you check the walls. Okay. So let's go in here. Let's do this. I'm gonna change the settings. So we come down here. This is kind of hard to see on the video. Mm -hmm. Go to fine. And then let's do that. Now I'll have to see a little bit more. But this wall has the cedar shakes on it, yeah. and this one doesn't. So that's a wood stud on that one, yeah. and this one's the wood stud. Is 
Again, so what to the easy fix? So this will be good on your second floor. Mm -hmm. So you just click that. Uh, that. Thank you. Yes. So that was this tool right here, just to match properties. So you click on the one that's good and then carry it through. As long as that's black, you can change them all. Okay, now see these. Right here, yeah. So this is a wall that's kind of funky. This is the original. Yeah, so okay, yeah. so let me just switch over here. Yeah, so this separation wall should come down to this wall. Yeah. This one should come back. So yeah, and it's gonna kind of cause a little so bit of grief. Have to redraw. No, we don't have to redraw things. That's crazy, man. What I'm gonna do is get rid of this heavy black line. So that's in the view, and they just go to thin lines. And then we can see what's going on a little better. And then I go back to manage, manage, align, and then want this, oops, this back of the faces. And we just have to cancel out and go back in. I'm not sure what's going on. So I want to match with this face here, that edge, and that pulls it down. So now this wall is the right place for the doors. So the door there can be there. Okay, so we've attached a door to two different wall types. Uh -huh. All right, so that's where come the split tool comes into handy. So we're just going to cut a slicer right there. And then cut it. And then just match the top here. That makes it really quick and easy. Perfect now. Okay, thank yep. you. Just got to figure out what you did. Should that one, should I use the... Yeah, the corner tool? Yeah. Right there. Okay. Oh, two more. Okay. Yep, give that one to close those up. Yep, perfect. Okay, thanks. Good deal. These are the nice houses. Where do I? Okay, that, is that today? Yeah, that's today. All right, that is... Okay. Okay, and I know again if you haven't done the pre state test. It was in week one. If you'll get that done, then the rest of the class will like you. Just turn those over into practice tests once you've done it. Because what that'll do, it'll hold me that score, but it won't count on your grade. But I can't do that until you've all finished 